so that everyone else can see what's going on if they miss it. Um, all right, so uh, welcome to the first workshop with uh, Leighton House uh, in collaboration with Leighton House. We're going to be looking at the collection of wonderful tiles and objects um, for four classes, over four classes. So tonight we are looking at carnations, cypress, and vases, and also how the um, British arts and crafts movement comes into that. Um, I have a few things that um, I'm going to get to just as uh, housekeeping when it comes to the Google Drive and everything like that, and then to just kind of explain um, what's going on. Uh, and I will introduce myself. I am horrific at remembering to do that, but I will do that. I am Lorelai, by the way. We have, yeah, I'll do it now. Um, so I am an artist, I'm a Canadian artist. I live in Istanbul. I've been here for seven years. And um, I'll get more into detail of my work and, and kind of my educational background uh, in a minute. And uh, by doing a artist talk, with UNICEF Institute in London, I was fortunate to meet Charlotte, who is the education director at Leighton House. Um, and uh, we also get on well, so that's nice. Um, so we were able to kind of make this work. I have taught a few classes um, on Damascus tiles or Damascus ware in the, in the past. And so it was just a nice fit. Uh, and it was also um, a subject um, of my master's at the Prince's School of Traditional Art. Uh, I'm going to, oh, we have another Sarah here from the De Morgan Foundation. That's right, you sent me an email today. Thank you very That's much. That's really for, interesting, that one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you very much for um, introducing yourself as well. And our moderator also, Sarah, Sarah Toast, um, we've worked together for quite a few years uh, at the Museum of Islamic Art um, and we've had the chance to do lots of nice and creative things together. So uh, we've worked together in the past with this online learning um, and she's been a fantastic moderator so I wouldn't trust anyone else really I wouldn't <laughs> and um, and yeah so uh, looking at a few of the different things here, give me a second. Um, one thing that on the on this introduction here, I have the Oneness Project. Um, so I was still waiting for a, a slide from uh, Leighton House, and hopefully for the next class we'll we'll have it because it'll still be in time. So um, there is a project going on where they are building um, a mural that's going to be taking that will take up a, a certain area and I'll have more more details for you guys next week and so many of you have have donated to help have this project come to fruition and many students also were asking how can they also um, donate so we'll give you that information if if you uh, can be generous or want to be generous um, we'll give you that kind of information also um, next is the Google Drive. Now, yesterday evening, I found out that um, only 200 people can have a link to a Google Drive at a time, which was news to me. So I'm finding a solution because we are many students. We are, uh, last I checked, 325 different participants. Um, so I will rectify that. You will all be able to access it in one way or another. Don't worry about that. Just have a little patience with me. Um, and then just discussing some of the stuff that you'll find inside of the Google Drive, you will find um, there's an article written by me. Um, there is, I can't remember, there may or may not be some of my artwork that pertains to Damascus tiles, as well as some different uh, photos that are taken from Leighton House as well as different museums that have some Damascus tiles. Those are for personal use and I'm just saying that so you know. Um, those are for personal educational use. They can't be used in publishing or anything like that. I just put the disclaimer out there um, just so that you're aware of that, that these are not uh, licensed 
images. Um, and then, ha, huh, yes, uh, workshop sign up. So I got a lot of frantic emails today about not having the Google link, uh, not the Google link, um, the link to the class. So one thing just to kind of keep in mind, there's two times where you get the, the Google, or I keep saying Google, the Zoom link. One is in an email after you register and two is just after you registered on that page, you will have the Zoom link as well as the password. So just try to pay attention to that for the next classes if you're planning to sign up. Um, and if you don't get an email, uh, check your trash bins first, check your uh, promotion bin, whatever kind of areas that it may go to, check those first. Uh, I don't say that because I don't wanna talk to you or email you, but because there are so many people interested in the classes, um, you know, I got uh, like 60 emails today. So I realized there was an issue in being able to understand where, um, where to get the link for the Zoom class. Uh, but if you need more information, um, we can try to help you out there uh, on how to find it. No. And yes, um, so because we are so many students, just have a little bit of uh, grace and patience with me um, because there is there is quite a few uh, to, to deal with um, on multiple different platforms. So we are gonna get started and um, is that everything? I just wanna make sure. Yeah, we'll talk more about the Oneness campaign uh, next week that's going on at um, Leighton House, uh, fingers crossed, I'll have all of the information for you then. So let's see. Just to say, if anybody has any questions for Lorelei as we go through, if you could put them in the chat, then what I'll do is I'll group them all together. Um, but I will stop Lorelei halfway through if there's something that we need to ask that is related to what we're directly doing next. Yeah, and um, how long will you have access to the classes? You'll have, um, so when all of the group of four classes are finished, you'll have one extra week. So that's a total of five weeks from the first class, if that makes sense. Um, and then after that, in order for me to be able to use those different things uh, in, uh, you know, in different projects, then I will turn off that. Um, so you can also share it to your to your computer. That's another thing. So if you want to have it forever, uh, you can share it to your Google Drive. You can share it to your desktop, whatever you may be using. Okay. So let's get going here, so we can have fun drawing. Okay, all right, so I'm just going to give you a brief look at some of the projects I have on the go at the moment. Um, and I just realized I think I spelled camouflage wrong. <laughs> so um, I'm working uh, primarily on ceramic as well as on paper. Um, I, I studied at uh, the Fine Arts University at Concordia University. Um, I studied in drawing, painting, and ceramics. Um, and so these are a few projects I'm working on. I like to work in pen and ink. Uh, I did a artist residency at the Alhambra. So I have a lot of stuff that's been influenced by that. Um, the school bus here is a part of my female Muslim travelers project I'm still working on. So it's a little bit of a sneak peek. Yeah. Um, and so, as I said before, in my master's project, I did some work related to uh, Damascus tiles and Damascus ware. This was something called Damascus Garden, and it was a part of um, a whole series of pieces called Ahlan wa Sahlan, um, where I did, you know, a whole tableware set. Um, and so with these, I took certain elements that were traditional, whether it be the color, the motif, etc., and changed compositions or added different things to try to make something new. These are three separate ceramic plates. They're currently housed in Rumi's cave in London. So if you're, if you're close to that area, please go and visit them. Let me know they're okay. Um, and all of these plates are quite large, like for ceramic, um, 
for ceramic sizes, these are 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters. So they are quite a feat to try to actually work on. And they all turned out well and didn't break, which is also a plus. Um, and then also the reason why we're all here today is Leighton House. Um, so uh, during the, over these four weeks, I'm gonna share more and more information about the site. Um, I didn't want to bombard you with too much information in one class because then we wouldn't get to any of the fun stuff, you know, the drawing. So little by little, I'll give you little pieces of information and how they all tie together. Um, oh, I just remembered. Uh, I remembered that there are quite a few Turkish students who signed up. In the Google Drive, there is uh, an article written in Turkish about Leighton House by uh, Omar, uh, Omar Farouk Yeni, he's a friend of ours. Um, so with Nihayet magazine. Um, so it's nice to have something in your, in your mother tongue. So uh, I shared that there. So for those of you who can read Turkish or are Turkish, whatever it may be, that's available for you to read. And the reason I mention that is because these photos here are actually taken by Omar as well. And he shared some of them with me. So some of those are also in the, the Google Drive. So here we are in the Arab Hall looking out into the, into the foyer, I guess you could call it. And um, you can see the, the beautiful tiles that we're gonna look at today. And then also um, in the background over here where we have our uh, peacock, um, this is one of the tiles that we're going to look at today and learn how to reproduce. I have a better photo, but um, just to see it in context because it does show up in a few places. Um, let's see here. Continue. All right. Um, so these are some more uh, interior views. And as I said before, I'm going to get more into Leighton House in the next class. Uh, because we are looking at the uh, British Arts and Crafts movement today. Um, give me a second. My apologies for it to be choppy. I get, I keep getting more and more students coming in. Okay, so we have, we have tiles as well as we have mosaics up here at the top. Again, we have our mighty peacock uh, showing itself again, as well as the taxidermy one I showed you before. Um, what's really interesting um, and kind of uh, an easy way to spot Damascus tiles is by the four colors that you see in comparison to, to Iznik. So Iznik, a lot of the time people, um, will remember that very bright, vibrant red color. And in the Damascene tiles, we don't have that. And there's reasons for that. It, it comes down to um, location as well as time period that they were made. Um, but that's, you know, that's belongs to my isn't it class discussion. What we're gonna look at here are the colors that we see in the Damascene tiles. So we have the cobalt oxide, which is the turquoise color, we have the, sorry, copper oxide is turquoise, cobalt oxide is the dark blue. We have some kind of different variations of green. Sometimes they're more grass green, sometimes more olivey. Those are uh, chrome oxide. And then we have the, pur the purple, which is um, manganese, which gives us a nice purple color. Um, you get a huge variation in that purple color. Sometimes it's very pale and looks like a stain and sometimes it's very dark and it looks almost black. Um, they are all the same color. It just comes down to purity of, um, of material and application. So we get both of those. Uh, I find, um, even though I've studied Isnik tiles for a long time, I find I am, um, you know, a little bit closer to the I enjoy the whimsicalness of the Damascene tiles. There's a little bit less of that um, structure that uh, that you get in the Isnik tiles. So it kind of has a little bit more flow and a little bit more of a kind of narrative to it. Lorelai, what date would you give for the Damascene tiles? Roughly, uh, they are fifteen fifty. They're yeah, they're fifteen fifty. They are in and around that time. Um, they, I believe. 
they go up into just before the 1600s. They are, they do continue afterwards, actually, just to be fair, they do continue afterwards, whether it be renovation projects or, um, yeah, generally renovation projects. Um, and um, there was another thing I was gonna say, renovation projects. And um, so you have the Ottomans take over uh, Damascus around that time period. And a lot of the time the Damascene tiles fall under the Iznik umbrella, where I don't know if I would necessarily agree with that. Um, it is labeled in like when you're learning different styles of Iznik art, they call it Damascene style. Um, and I don't know, I don't know if I like that kind of classification um, because Iznik as well as being a style it is a location and these were not necessarily made in, in Iznik. There are a few panels in Istanbul that do have similar colors, but you can tell that the panel itself, like the design on the panel is very um, quintessentially like Ottoman, not uh, Damascus Ottoman. Um, I hope that answers the question. Okay, let's see here. Yes, here is our wonderful pattern that kind of inspired this class. So as, as I said before, this class is called um, Carnation, Cypress and Vase. So I'm loosely calling this little planter down here a vase. Um, but we'll look at more vases in this class to see the different kind of variations that we have. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that all of these flowers are indigenous unless they are a depiction of flowers in paradise. Um, those kind of abstract flowers that we see in Iznik Ottoman, they're a little bit lesser in, in the Damascene where they're a little bit more naturalistic. Um, so we have Cyprus, which has, you know, a, a spiritual kind of connotation to it where, um, you know, there's a belief that the Cypress tree connects heaven and earth because it's so tall. There's that kind of understanding. And then, um, you know, this kind of vase motif isn't, isn't new to Damascene, sty uh, Damascene style tiles or, or wares. It's a way to kind of demonstrate like a, an abundance of the vessel, so to speak, or an uh, overabundance. Um, okay, let's see. All right, so now we've got into the British Arts and Crafts Movement and William Morris starting in the 1800s, uh, 1800s, 1880s. Um, I'm sure most people, especially our, our British students, a lot of people have most likely grown up with renditions of these patterns, whether it be on fabric or on wallpaper or in calendars or wherever it may be, have come across this um, or patterns that have taken their inspiration from, from William Morris. Uh, and I'll get a little bit into him in a second. But what I wanted to mention here is that these patterns here, this one on the left, with the birds, that's called Strawberry Thief. It's considered to be one of his um, most, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, most famous patterns. And then on the right hand side, we have another one, which is I believe called Tulip. Oof, it's left my mind here. It's in the, it's in the, the, what's it called? It's in the Google Drive, the actual title. Um, but this is the repeating pattern for also different wallpaper that was also very um, uh, popular at the time. So to get, to get into the British Arts and Crafts Movement, um, it began, as I said, in the late 1800s, 1880s, around there. And there are two kind of main individuals that are are known for bringing this about. It's not just an art movement, it is a social movement also. 
Um, and it is a reaction to the industrialization of, of the UK um, and also what that did not only artistically, but also to laborers and families, et cetera, and how that industrialization period um, kind of brought about subpar, um, you know, everyday objects that had no soul left in them anymore. They weren't beautiful. They, you know, they were just purely purposeful and weren't even nice to look at. And there was no craftsmanship as well as because they're made by machines, right? And then also the people who are making them were also being treated as robotic. Um, uh, and then also the environment, the detrimental environmental effects too. So it's looking at all of that from many different, um, you know, uh, angles. And then, so we have William Morris and we have John Ruskin. John Ruskin was, I believe, considered the first art historian at uh, Oxford University, uh, not art historian, art history professor. Um, and then Morris kind of went his own way and he didn't necessarily go down the art history route, but he went down the kind of human side of manufacturing and creating um, all of the goods that we know of today, whether it be the different designs on tiles, wallpaper, fabric, as well as furniture pieces, which a lot of people forget about. Um, yeah, and they just saw that craftsmanship had died, things were soulless, and they really believed that the object needed to serve a purpose as well as be beautiful and be created in a situation that um, wasn't heartless. You know, it's kind of uh, perhaps messages for, for the days that we live in now where everything is getting less and less personal. Um, and there's a really wonderful quote by William Morris, and he said, have nothing in your house, or yeah, have nothing in your houses that you do not know to be useful or believe to be beautiful. So uh, that's exactly what he lived by. Um, if you are in London, uh, his home, I believe, well, not now because you guys are on lockdown, but you could visit his home in Hammersmith. Um, also, a lot of the photos I took from his website, or took of his work are from the website, as well as from the De Morgan Foundation for William Morgan, who we'll look at in a minute, who was also a part of this movement. Um, also, what's really interesting is that the British arts and crafts movement is something that we still have um, affecting us today. So a lot of the time when we're looking to buy something or bring something into our home, we're looking for quality. Um, a lot of the time quality means it's been handmade. And so different things like, um, for example, looking at joints in furniture that are exposed, that is totally British arts and crafts movement. Um, showing the craftsmanship in, you know, wood joining, um, also in different upholstery uh, techniques, and then also not necessarily hiding, you know, the handmade imperfections. Um, and yeah, they continue to inspire typographers, graphic designers, environmentalists, activists, even today, especially with different labor uh, movements um, and workers' rights. Uh, let's see here. And basically what they were doing was challenging the unchecked and unmonitored um, uh, industrial capitalism that was the result of the industrial revolution. Um, and they did create a guild system that also had profit sharing. So for the artists or craftspeople that were involved in that, they weren't just necessarily paid an hourly wage. It was, it was much more fair. Um, and so there's quite a, quite a few kind of, uh, revolutionary things that they were doing at the time. So that I'm, I'm mentioning that because it's, as I said before, I don't want you to just think of the arts and crafts movement as just being literally surface pattern. It's much more than that. Um, and they also countered the Academy's hierarchy of art where it's constantly looking at 
you know, you have painting as the pinnacle of all art and then everything kind of falls underneath. Uh, and then the guilds such as crafts kind of get tucked away in a corner that's like, almost like a dirty word, oh, you're, you're a craftsman, you know, like there isn't this prestige attached to the word of artist. Um, and then so within their own guilds that they created, you have the master teacher um, or apprentice, if you want to call it relationship. And so people are building skills, you know, everything has its, its plus and minuses, but um, they were trying to bring the skill, bring the beauty, bring the soul back into the work. There are a few, there's quite a few actually, other artists that you can look at, that is Walter Crane, uh, and that will be brought into, I think, next week's class. Um, William de Morgan, we're going to look at in a minute. John Ruskin, as I mentioned, his daughter, uh, May Morris, as well as Gustav Holst. Um, and this actually caused a lot of art schools to start up too. Um, I believe Glasgow St School of Art was linked to this, Swansea was, there's quite a few. Um, let's see, I mentioned this. Ha, huh, and another way to look at it is like, um, that we have a bit of an, an obsession and I don't mean obsession in a bad way, but, um, you know, trying to find things that are local, local materials, local food, etc. That can also kind of be tied into uh, the British arts and crafts movement, which is an interesting kind of segue into Islamic art that I'm going to try to make. And that is, there are many, many different um, elements that were taken from Islamic art. And that was because many of these artists were visiting uh, for example, they were friends with Frederick Layton, Sir Frederick Layton, or they were uh, like De Morgan was going to the V&A gallery that had many tiles that were brought in. So they were finding inspiration in these tiles. And then also at the same time, like we have the strawberry thief, we have many different aspects that you can kind of associate with the symmetry and the different um, kind of floral motifs. If we look in the center here, uh, as you spend a little bit more time with me, you'll kind of get the lingo. So we have this Hatai motif, which is like if you were to cut a flower, um, like splice it and open it up. That's kind of this motif that we end up getting. Um, so there's lots of different elements that come from Islamic art that are then rehashed and using um, indigenous plants or flowers like Islamic artists did, you know, like the, the carnations or the tulips that they had around, but now the British artists are doing it in a similar way with what they have around them, with what's indigenous for them. Um, let's see, I think that's it for that. And then just some stylistic things to look at today, just to make some comparisons. So, um, we have William de Morgan. Uh, again, in the next class, we'll look in detail some uh, very specific pieces that he made that uh, we can see the direct link. Here, these are almost like studies. Um, we're seeing the studies of different tiles that are actually in the Leighton House collection. And then keeping in today's theme with vases and carnations down here, here's another one of his kind of watercolor sketches. And then um, on the right hand side, this is from the De Morgan Foundation uh, Sublime Symmetry um, collection. So, you know, these, these were not made in, in the Middle East, they were not made in Turkey or in Syria, they were made by De Morgan. And then one of the things you can look at here, we have these makas. And what's really interesting is that the background that we have, and we'll, we'll again, I'll put these side by side in, I think the third class or the fourth class, the class with the grapes and pomegranates, you'll see how that pattern and this pattern are also linked. So hopefully by the end of four classes, we'll be able to make a lot of different links to how everything kind of came together over time.
And then back to Leighton House. Um, this is the bird attacking lions panel. Um, and I believe it's in the Arab Hall. Uh, I wasn't entirely sure if it was in the Arab Hall. And let's see here. Yeah, thank you very much, Sarah, for sharing that. Um, so yeah, um, we have some different vases in here, which is something that occurs a lot <coughs> in the Damascene style. Um, we have roses, tulips, hyacinth, etc. And we have these wonderful different parrots. Uh, and then in the bottom here, we have a lion, oops, we have a lion, I think, attacking a, some kind of a deer or, yeah, a gazelle, perhaps. I'm not exactly sure what the gazelles are called in this region, but I think you get what I mean. And I think that's about it. So, uh, oh, we have irises too. That's something that's also uncommon. Um, it's not so common in the Isnik tiles. You have it sometimes, but it's definitely like a staple in the Damascene ones. And then also something that's really interesting are these, um, the use of borders in Damascene tiles is a little different than the Isnik ones where um, sometimes in the Isnik panels, you'll have like borders on borders on borders on borders, which is, you know, very, um, very interesting itself. But you have this, kind of uh, wonky in a good way kind of border that that goes around these patterns and it's just like enough you know um, yeah so you can tell I'm I'm impartial to the Damascene tiles and then is this the last one ah yes and so um, the Victorian Albert Museum has a lot of different Damascene tiles as well. Even there are some pieces that were in Leighton House that are now in, in the VNA. They have uh, an incredible collection online as well. Um, I think the Met has a few, but not as much as the VNA. So you can kind of peruse those. They have some really nice panels too, like this. So we have in the center a vase. And a lot of the vases, which I will show you in a second. A lot of the vases have similar motifs on the interior. And yeah, here we go. So if we look over here, you can see some different motifs on the interior vases, but they're all quite similar. Um, there we go. Um, we're going to give you some different books that you can look at or different resources too. There is a fantastic one that does not treat Damascus tiles as a subcategory and it is called Damascus Tiles by Arthur Milner. Um, there are some articles I included about Leighton House and about uh, Damascus Tiles by Melanie Gibson. I believe I'm getting her name right. I hope so. Um, and so she's done some really excellent work also that we can look at. Um, and actually just for, just to show this. So we have this one here. You can, you can see my, my screen, right? Where my hand is? No. 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 Okay. I'll show you after them. <laughs> I don't think I can show everything all at one time. No, no, people are going to have to pin that screen when we get to the next stage because ah, there's okay. so many people okay. online. No yeah. So just keep, just keep, one moment here. Just keep this macaw one in your mind. Try to freeze it there for a second. Um, okay, so I think that's it for that. Uh, we also have the cypress and the... Um, the grapes, but then what's really interesting are these tankards here, which, you know, um, everyone says that they would have held iron. Um, I don't know if it was necessarily so wholesome all the time, <laughs> um, but uh, especially inside the palace, who knows? Um, but this is this kind of handle that you have that comes up in a square like that, that is 
you know, a very well-known Ottoman uh, shape. So it's interesting that it's coming up in the Damascene tiles. Uh, perhaps it was a regional kind of um, shape for, for drinking ware. There's one question here, yes, that says, what would the tankard have held? <laughs> what would your tankard hold? <laughs> what would you put in your cup? <laughs> I don't know, true. it depends. <laughs> it depends on the day some days, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> pomegranate juice. <laughs> yeah, exactly, pomegranate juice. All right, so now we're gonna get to the drawing. So now what I want you to do is find my other, um, my other uh, Lorelei. So if you look up, there should be two showing. Is there yeah, Sarah? I tried to take a picture of, yes, I tried to take a picture of it actually. There's, um, uh, the image is of a blue tile so look for the other one that says Lorelei Ray. It's a static picture of a blue tile. Um, you need to find that one and then click the three dots in the top right hand corner and pin that video to your screen. And then that video will be showing up uh, completely and you'll be able to see Lorelei drawing. I don't know if we can spotlight the video. I don't know what that even means actually. Oh, here. Okay, so Laura, if you scroll up in on any of the pictures, you'll see as uh, you'll see a kind of uh, blue button that has three dots on it, and it, when you click on that, you'll have different choices, and you can say add pin or choose pin, whatever whatever comes up. Yeah, I'm trying to take a picture of it, but for some reason, um, you should dropping. see a blue tile with okay. my hand kind of I've waving sent a on it. I put a screenshot in the chat, so. Yeah, or if you go into participants, if you write my name, you should have two. If you type in L-A-U-R-E, it should come up. Okay. So that was a little bit longer than I wanted, but we had to wait a few minutes for everyone to get in. Okay. So navigating somewhere. Yeah, uh, so Donna, you're just supposed to pin my screen. That's it. Okay. So for everybody who's still trying to find that at the top of your screen, you've got a lot of little pictures of other people. If you use the blue arrows to move left or right, you need to find the second screen that's marked Lorelei Ray. Right now, it's just got a completely white piece of paper on it. I put when my compass find... on it now. Okay, a compass. So when you find that picture, you just need to put your mouse on it and you get a little blue box in the top corner with three dots. When you click that, that's when you can, you can pin that picture and it becomes the main picture on your screen. Uh, Jahan, it should work on an iPad. I know it doesn't work on an iPhone, but I think it works on an iPad. Ah, May says, if you're on the phone, then double tap and it will pin it. Oh, great, thanks, May. I didn't know that. <laughs> okay. If everybody turns off your video, it might help people find the one that's left on. Yes, turn off your videos and then hopefully it's easier to find. Perfect. Okay, give you guys one more minute. Right, Farah's put a good suggestion on there, which is if you click on participants, scroll through the list of participants. Um, see how it works. 
It should be near the top. Okay. Yes, Sadia, that's the one we're talking about. Yep. Yep, it's right. That's the second Lorelei. It's the one with a, um, the, the, instead of having the initials, it has a picture of Lorelei. Okay. No. So once you find that participant, you need to put your mouse over it if you're using a mouse and you get the little, uh, you get a little blue square with three dots. That's the one you need to tick um, or double click. If you're on an iPad, you just put your finger on the picture and the three dots will pop up. Okay, so I closed the chat just for, for me so I can pay attention. Yeah, that's fine. I've got it. Okay. I'm wishing I could show everybody my screen. <laughs> Still nothing, Anne. Um, hmm. uh, and do you have the ability to search the participants? Like you'll see a participant list. And if you, if you can search in the participant list, then you can um, find, you'll see my name twice. I'm, I'm sure Sarah's going to be able to, to help. Yeah, I can, I can talk people through it, no problems. Just send me okay. a message in the chat. Um, this should be a point. Okay. Somebody's still got their microphone on. <laughs> yeah, someone has their microphone on. <laughs> we can hear your whispering. So we can show. Okay. Yeah. I think everyone's mics are off. They are. I think we should turn off our videos as well. Um, I think everyone's are turned off pretty much. I don't know. I can still see a couple. And I see that Jane Rosemary Holt and Ronnie Gale have their hands up. Can you just let yeah. me know? Is it accidental or is it for help? I did send a message asking. I think it might be accidental. <laughs> ha, okay, okay, no problem. Now all I'm seeing is a is is a complete blank piece of paper. That's right. right? That's exactly that's, what you that's used to correct. Say, yeah. Do you see my hand now? Okay. Yes. Yes. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Thank goodness. Right. I'll mute myself then. Uh, we are finishing in about one hour and ten minutes. Whoever just asked, my apologies. I didn't catch the name. I just unmuted because I can't send the message. Uh, I just have your pick. I just have you on screen. I've unmuted because I was asking a question ages ago. I had my hand up. Uh, who's that one, Ronnie? That's Ronnie, yeah. There's no facility for me to ask specific questions. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I did reply up. to you, but I think maybe we didn't see you. How no, can we help Ronnie? <laughs> Um, I wanted to know, is it is it usual to have a figure? There was a figure on one of the tiles. And is it usual to have a figure, a person? A person? Yeah, we have. There are some tiles that have um, almost like miniature, like if you know of the Persian miniature style, there is a, a panel in the Damascus tiles. Are you are you talking in Islamic art or are you talking in these specific tiles at the museum? I was talking about the ones, I think I was talking about the um, the, the more modern ones, the um, arts and crafts ones. Huh, I'm, that's an interesting there all, question. There was a figure of a person at the bottom uh, of one of the long, tall, tall ones. And I just wondered, because I didn't think it was it was usual to have them in, in the original Islamic art. 
there there are in the original Islamic art, especially the Persian tiles, but um, I'll have to check what you're talking about and then I can give you an answer. Like maybe when we take a break, I can take a look at what you're okay. talking about and then I'll answer, okay. okay? Lovely, yeah, thanks. I'll turn off now. No, not at all. <laughs> thanks, Ronnie, I'm sorry. That's all right. Okay, so the sheet of paper is because we're gonna start drawing now. Um, so I have my ruler and I'm going to draw one horizontal line in the middle of the page, like so. Now the radius for our compass is going to be eight centimeters. So that is from point to point, eight centimeters. Uh, do you want landscape or portrait, Lorelei? Uh, it's a square, so it doesn't matter, whatever you're more comfortable with. I'm doing landscape just because of the orientation of my desk. So we're gonna put, I'm gonna move this over. Don't worry, I just saw on the screen. It's not exactly where I want it to be. There we go, a little bit better, yeah. Okay, so we put down our circle that has a radius of eight centimeters. Uh, it's okay, Sadia. Um, uh, if you would like to continue, uh, with us, you can, you can watch this at a, at a later time. It's as you like, or you can like sketch some of the motifs as we get to them. It's, it's up to you, but you do need a compass for, um, for making the tile and then also some of the motifs inside of the tile. So we have our circle here. I'm going to on either side, both here, and here, I'm going to put the compass point. Yeah, smaller than A4 is fine. I'm, I'm working uh, smaller than A4. No, smaller than A4 is going to be too small. Uh, I'm working on A3, but A4 is fine. Uh, the, the, the supplies were mentioned before, Sadia. They're on the website and also on all of the social media platforms. Okay, so just make sure that your compass has not moved. And then we're going to draw a circle like so. I'm just doing a half circle. You don't need the full one. We just need 50%, like so. Then we have these connection points. So in order to get the vertical to draw in our other circles, we need to do something known as the Vesica Pisces. So basically what we do, we put the point of our compass here like so. And then on the opposite side, we do the same thing like that. We come down to the bottom, exactly the same thing. Oops. Like so. And then like so. All right, so now, just have to sharpen my pencil quickly. So now this gives us three points in order to make sure that our line is going to be straight. Interesting. Ah, there we go. 
Mine was a smidge off for whatever reason. Lorelai, there's just one question that says, could you just quickly explain how you got the cross at the top again, please? Yeah, I can redo it. Give me a second. I can erase it and do it so you can see. It's easier to see than to kind of explain. Okay, so we have our compass. We have these two spots here. So they're the intersection of the circles. What I do is I take this, I put it on that intersection and I like that. I'll move it down a little bit so you can see it better. Then I come over here, same thing. Like so. And I'm just double checking down here. My compass wiggled out of place a bit. Okay. And then we draw through all three of those lines. So we have here, the midpoint, and this bottom one. And there you go. So now where you're going to add the next circles is not at this point here. Forget about that. We're gonna add the circle here. So we're gonna put the compass point where I've circled these intersections. Exactly the same. You can remeasure just to make sure your compass hasn't shifted. And so as we're doing this, I'll tell you that like a lot of the designs, not every single one of the Isnik designs, but a lot of the, the designs do have um, a significant amount of geometry as a foundational element. Um, so that's why we have to do this. It's not a, you know, a, a sketching class actually. It is, you know, building these motifs. So there is a structure behind them. So now what I'm doing is I am drawing a square around these four large petals. And that's easily done because we have already created a square. So from point to point to point, you're actually making a square. It's equal on all sides. Like so. Like so, so we have a happy little square. Let's see here. Okay. All right, so the next part is we have these petals. And if you can see, we naturally have diagonals. So I'm going to ask you to draw in those diagonals like so. Those are going to help us later. Um, I can hear someone. It was me. I just one uh -huh. person said she can't see what she's do you're doing. It's off the screen, but I think I can see it quite clearly. Yeah. Um, is anybody else having problems seeing the full page? Yep, for this year, I've got you. I, I am definitely. I, I'm not getting it either. I, I'm not seeing. Um, I see Lorelai's name twice up, but um, I'm not getting three dots to click on. So. 
Um, huh. Right, what, what are you using? Um, I'm Zoom and I'm on a laptop. A laptop. Yeah. Okay, so if you move your... If, okay, uh, sorry, is it, sorry, is it Felicity I'm talking to? Sorry. No, it's Sharon. Sharon, okay. Sharon, yeah. I'm just going to send you a message on the chat, uh, but to okay. you directly, okay? Hold on a second. Thank you. No worries. <laughs> I moved it up a little bit. Does that... Hmm, interesting. Um, if you're on a phone or on a tablet, try perhaps moving the orientation. Yeah, it might be best to do it portrait actually because your your screen is portrait. Yeah. Okay. So the next part that we're going to do is the. Uh, actually, am I going to change this up? Let me see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What we're going to do next is actually draw in the vase, so to speak, on the bottom here. The vase is gonna come up at about like two thirds of this space. It's not an exact measurement, um, but if you want one, it's eight centimeters, so you could do five. So if you measure down from here, it's five, or if you measure from the bottom up, it's three. I hope that makes sense and didn't confuse anyone like that. So this little dash I've put here is gonna be the top of this planter vase thing. <clears throat> I'm gonna take, uh, now I'm gonna go back to my pencil. Can you repeat please? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you measure from the bottom up to here, oops, sorry, I just moved this by accident. If you measure from the bottom line, up three centimeters, put a dash, okay? That should be fine. Okay, thank you. No problem. So just a straight line across. We're gonna overlap that line a little bit and uh, just do half for now. I'm gonna show you how to transfer on the other side so that you know your, your pattern um, looks the same, looks identical. So we're just crossing over this line a little bit. And then since this is your planter, right? Since this is your planter, um, you can decide how it looks. I'm gonna show you based on the tile that's in Leighton House itself. And actually I noticed the other day that this exact pattern is in the Aminunu uh, new mosque or Yenijami in, you know, kind of one of the, the economic centers of Istanbul, identical. So I kind of come in a little bit like that. I'm putting another little... Uh, could you just re uh, remind everybody how to do that last line? Sorry. Um, this kind of S shape. Like This S shape, Sarah. I think so, yeah. The question is, could you please okay. explain how to make that last line? So this is like a very, very soft S shape. So if you were to stretch out an S, you would get this. Um. Uh, there is a reference picture in the Google Drive as well as on the um, the handouts I made for you. So those are in the Google Drive link that I sent everyone. <laughs> you beat me to it. I was just typing. <laughs> which which is this pattern, um, Lorelai? This is the this is the carnation and cypress one. Um, I would do a, a screen share, but I'm worried that I would throw everything else off. So yeah. I'm not going to do that. Um, one second, I can, can I drop? That's all right, I can look whilst you continue, no problem. Well, I have the handout. Let me see if I can share it. Um, everyone in meeting. And, okay. So I'll, here we go.
how to decide the placement. There we go. In the center. I just sent the handout, so you should have that already, but if you want to open it while we're doing this, then that's good. And, okay. All right, so I'm getting back to teaching this class, hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, 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 I, I'm on the track, don't worry, leave it with me. <laughs> okay, no problem. So we're going to continue this bottom part and we're just going to draw a foot. It's going to curve out and then down like so. There we go. And I've just kind of gotten that in a little darker. And then I'm just going to put a bit of a lip on it, like so. All right. Okay, so next part. So we have our little vase in there, half of it. Now we're going to start putting in the carnations. So we have um, these diagonal lines, and then we have here. So we're going to have, let me count, <laughs> one, two, three carnations. And at the bottom, we're going to have a tulip. And then on the sides, we're going to have the cypress trees. So the carnations, your radius is going to be 1.6 centimeters. So let's get that. And then after, after we do 1.6 centimeters for all of our carnations, I am going to take a very quick five minute break. And everyone, you know, can get some water, get some tea, whatever you need. And then we'll be back in continuing our pattern. Let's see here, 1.6, 1.6, 1.6, 1.6, 1.6, 1.6, 1.6, 1.6, 1.6, 1.6, 1.6, 1.6, 1.6, 1.6, 1.6, 1.6, 1.6, 1.6, 1.6, 1.
This one here, it's going to be in a different direction. These are fanning, but this one is going to be more vertical. Must be flying still. So from here to here, it's also five. So this is five. And then from here to here, five centimeters. So five, 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 keeping it simple. Uh, it crowd, which, do, which first circle do you mean? The one at the top here? Uh, yeah, it's one centimeter down from the top. And then I took the pencil lead, put it down, and then did this. No problem. Okay, now this last one here. Like so. And we're gonna play with this one a little bit, so don't worry. This one's gonna get played with a bit. Now, the last thing we're going to do before we take a quick break is our uh, cypress tree. Of course, yeah, don't worry, there'll be enough space for the cypress, don't worry. I am looking at that one, but if it needs to be moved, it will move it, don't worry. Okay, so the cypress tree, it's very skinny at the top, and it's very full on the bottom. Um, I'm gonna draw in this kind of pedestal like, uh, yeah, pedestal, pedestal like, um, <laughs> I lost my words, pedestal like planter, there we go, like so. Pretty much within the same kind of range as the pot on the other side, around there. But the shape's gonna be a little different. It's gonna come in and kind of go down like a, like a trunk, like so. So we draw it across and a very elongated curve and then straight. So that base is gonna help us know how wide our tree is gonna be and then up. Now, as Monique wrote, perhaps we don't have enough space. Um, we'll see when we draw the plant and if we need to move it a bit, then, then we can. We are the artists here, so that's not such a big deal. And as I said before, these, these patterns don't have as much um, back, um, don't have the same amount of geometric foundation as some of the other Isnic patterns. They were definitely, you know, repeated. They created um, almost like a stencil where they could reproduce it, but it wasn't always exact. Okay, so we have both of our pots now. We're going to go out from here. And this shape might take you a couple chances to get, so sketch it in first. It's easier for me if I kind of get the width down here or the fullness. And then I go back up to the top where I know it's gonna be the thinnest. And then I bring my line into that. And again, if you're using pencil, you know, erasers were invented for a reason, right? <laughs> so don't, don't worry so much about that. So those are some of the major shapes. 
Uh, Javeria, I sent um, uh, I sent a Google Drive link. Um, if you didn't get it, as uh, pardon me, excuse me, uh, send me an email if you did not get it, um, and I will kind of. If there are other people who didn't get it, I'll I'll get it to you. Um, there might be an issue if you have a Hotmail account or a Yahoo account. So uh, we'll figure that out. And I did, if you scroll up to Varia, if you scroll up a bit, you'll see that I shared today's class notes just a little bit above. It's called Damascus Vases PDF. Okay, so we are at 918. Um, let's take a drink, bathroom, stretch break, whatever you may need, and be back here for uh, 920, or not 925, it's not 925 for you guys, whatever 25 on the hour is for you. I will see you in a few minutes. Yeah, can you leave the screen on and then people can just sort of see. Yeah, I'm going to leave the up. screen on, but I'm going to close my personal one and close sure. myself. Amazing. Thanks. I'm still on the chat if anybody wants to ask anything just during the break. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Wait, can you hear me? Sarah, can I ask you a question, please? Yes, yeah, go for it. Um, it's Shireen, you've just given me instructions. You said one centimeter away from the edge. That doesn't work when you look at the top left-hand corner, the leaf on the, the line, the diagonal line that starts from the sure. top left-hand corner. I understand. It's one centimeter away from where the circle cuts through that line. Okay. So if you follow the circle around the outside, you know, the, the central circle? Okay. So for the okay. diagonal line, yeah, got it? Okay, great. Okay, okay. thank you. No worries. There was but somebody else. But it still doesn't give us a total of six centimeters. Um, Lorelei has has marked from the center point to the pencil point. It's five centimeters. From that point to the circle is not one centimeter. No, that's right. It should be two point six. How does it happen? I don't know. So it's just kind of frozen. I think as long as it's in this in the in the rough place, Shireen, you should be all right. Don't worry if it's not precisely accurate, because it depends how you've put the other the other elements in. Okay, thank you. No problems. Hi. I hear somebody else then. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, I am actually following Lorelai quite good, but I actually missed the second petal. How the petal was made, actually. So, if anyone can explain that. Or the second the, petal, which one do you mean? Uh, basically, after the intersecting point, you know, where you get the cross on top and yes. then you intersect, and then you have four petals in the box. So, how did you get that petal? It was just intersecting circles first. Yes. Uh, so, how did you actually get the petals? I actually roughly made that. So, hello? Uh, yes. I, yes, I, I could probably help here. So, you have the square, yes? And you yes. have uh, where the horizontal and the vertical lines meet the square. Uh, I got that. You know yep. the petals, the petals yes. shape, basically. How That's right. So yeah. so the, the petals are created. That if you put your the point of your compass yes. to the uh, bit where your vertical line or your horizontal line meets the edge of the square. OK. Hold That's on. right, and you do a half, you, you do a semicircle. Semicircle well, top and bottom and on arc. both the sides. Yeah. So yeah, I'm you gonna do put it. my compass and it is open. The radius is still uh, six. Um, the, the radius is uh, whatever your eight. radius is for the original circle. Oh, okay. Eight. Eight was eight. Yeah. I got the seven, so I'm gonna... So your... I'm gonna... Put my compass and in the middle of the intersection where yep. all, yes. all the lines are inter intersecting. Yeah. Okay. So, so that should give you, uh, if you do a semicircle, ah. say the top. Uh, ah. of yeah. the square, Got that. Where, where Got the top that. of the square meets the vertical yeah. line, you should get the semicircle yeah. forming part of uh, the, the petal. 
and yeah the same perfect, perfect. thank you and so then much. if you go out to to the uh sides of the square where the horizontal line meets mm -hmm. the square again use yeah. that as your um Ah. of your circle to do your semicircles and then you'll get the four petals okay thank you so much Please. you're welcome sorry there was another question in the background there i think no i uh, know now how the petals were made I think I'm going to try it again. I can Maybe. somebody's got their um sound on. It's you, you know. <laughs> Let me see if I can see who's got the comedy show. Yeah, I I because I don't have any control over the mutes. <laughs> yeah, I found it. I found it. Um so Susan will send okay. the Google Drive link again uh, after the session. In the meantime, we've put the, the notes for this session in the chat, but I can post them again if you need me to. Actually, I'll tell you what, Susan, um, I'll send it to you directly. For the Google Drive? Uh, I'm just going to send her the, um, the, the notes for just now. Ah, OK. Um, just quick question, Susan. Did you sign up today through Leighton House, or did you sign up uh, earlier? Susan Bale. Um, Javaria, can you please contact Sarah for the notes, please? Okay. Okay, so just quickly, um, before we get back to what we were working on, I had mentioned a few different books. So there is this book here. And we're just going to give Sarah a chance to um, uh, do what she's doing. So this book is called Damascus. This isn't just Damascus tiles, um, but there are some really wonderful photos. And I'm trying to find the tiles for you. Um, oh, there we go. So we have um, one of the kind of panels that they're known for, some different ones. Oh my God, the glare is really bad. Um, Another one that, you know, this is in uh, Saladin's tomb in Damascus. Um, but then this is also one of the patterns that we find in uh, Leighton House. Also, um, you know, another one of, uh, these are very common tiles here from Darwish Pasha Mosque. Yeah, and you see just kind of some different information. But there's lots of different information in here. Um, you know, the Umayyad Mosque, a lot of the different palaces that belong to different families, um, some different kind of um, wood painting. I cannot remember the name of this at the moment. Um, what else? Yeah, lots of different stuff in there. Uh, marble uh, cutting, etc. Now this one, this one is available in Arabic and English. 
So far, our Arabic speakers, this is an option for you guys. This is from the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha. As you can see from, oh uh, yeah, the author, uh, sorry, Sarah, I'm making you multitask. That's all right. Um, it is Damascus, Hidden Treasures of the Old City. Um, and it's Bridget Keenan, the first book. I'll write that in the, in the thing. And then uh, Mia's book about Iznik. And so- Who's the author of that one? Of the Mia's book. Of ours, yeah. Oh, I think it's just <laughs> by the department. Let me see. I'll check. A power one that was the cover, that blue and white one. It's, it's that. <laughs> John Carswell. That, oh, I thought it was, okay. So Mia has a, a collection that has a few of the Damascene tiles. So if you remember from what I just showed you, sorry, the light is just, it's great for when I'm drawing, but not when I'm trying to show you photos. I don't know. Anyways, um, this there's quite a few versions of this plate, which you can't see very well. Um, and this one is at the Leighton House as well as at Doha. And I think there's another one somewhere. There's quite a few of them. This book is from the Museum of Islamic Art and Sarah is going to share it also. Um, it's just called Iznik. Yeah, I'm just gonna type them all out. So there's no Iznik problem. by Carswell. And then Damascus Tiles by Arthur Milner. Okay. All right. Oops. I'm going to have to fix that also. I'm working with a new light, which is causing me a little bit of grief. Okay. There we go. I think we're back in business now. Yeah, we should be okay. Okay. So I hope everyone is kind of um, on the same track now. You had a little chance to catch up if you needed to. Thanks, Sana. <laughs> You're seeing one part of the studio, the not so nice part. Um, but yeah, so I'm blessed to have a cozy studio. Um, okay, so let's keep going. All right, so we need to add the tulip and yeah, we have a few different sections to, to add. Let's see. All right, so now we are going to draw in this middle part. In Turkish, it's called ortaba. Um, I'll just write it. Can you see that? I think you should be able to see it. Kind of, yeah. Orta ba, orta meaning middle. And then ba, in this case, it's meaning like bringing things together. So that's exactly what this is doing in the center. It's like bringing all of the different stems of the carnation and the tulip together. So let's draw that next part. So again, we are about a centimeter above this midpoint here. Like so. Now this, this shape is a little tricky. So give yourself kind of the, the good grace to try to get the shape. Now we're gonna work on the exterior shape first. There are three lines we draw, the exterior, the middle, and then the interior line. And in the end, we have one finished motif. And even I'm switching the pencil. <laughs> so um, I just want to make sure you can see me. Yeah. So we start at this 
midpoint here and we come towards this horizon line and then we curl in like so. So I'm gonna go over that in marker, you can see it. Like so. Orta, orta, not orca. Sorry, yeah, with a T. And it's a soft G, a Turkish G, so it doesn't make a hard G sound like we have in English. Okay, so now we're gonna go out almost like a cloud and we're gonna make our way out. We have one, two, we're gonna extend this second one. It's gonna come out like so. And come back in. And then in, in, like that. So that's our exterior. Does that refer to the design motif or the long line down middle line? No, it, it refers to the actual motif that we're drawing. So we have this shape here. We're gonna follow that. So follow that shape in, in, and then it's gonna come in tight to that shape there, like so. And now we're gonna come into here. So we're, where this kind of flick out goes, we're gonna put a line on our vertical. Uh, hi, um, can you just tell me how you got the shape again, please? The whole thing? Uh, no, 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 the, the intricate one right in the middle. This the here. Central one, yeah. Okay. This one, yes. So here I go yes. in and I make a curl. So that's one centimeter from that kind of midpoint. And then I make like two kind of puffy cloud shapes and it comes out in kind of a, you know, flick. And then I bring it back in and then one bump, two, and then that's it for there. I go back up here and I'm following this shape. So I go in, matches that shape, again a second time, and then I bring it in tight to that bottom line there. Okay. So then from okay, this, thank you. no problem, no problem. I hope it helps. So I'm gonna take this one up and it's almost like making a big C. So just like that, like a C shape. So from there again, C shape. And then underneath we have this kind of bump and then again. So this is like an elongated S shape. If they like the shape, is it okay to, to use their pen or should they um, continue doing it in pencil? Or just um, use whatever the pen you're more comfortable, comfortable with, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I switched to pen just because I'm worried you can't see my pencil. Normally I would do it in pencil, to be honest. Because sometimes I don't like something after the fact. But don't worry, like there's lots of opportunity to tweak things later. Okay. So... Let's keep going because my did the time disappear. Oh. I know, I know. Okay, so now we have that. That's good to go. We have this uh, tulip up at the top. So that middle line that's in there is actually going to be one of our stems.
That middle line there is one of our stems and we'll just leave that as is. Now we have this one here. Don't connect at the top yet, but if you kind of sketch down, we pass through the under part of that ortaba motif and then we're okay. So kind of trace that along and then draw that shape in. And then this one here, it's gonna kind of be more squiggly. So I'm gonna take my pencil for this one because it might get changed. I'm gonna bring it in like so. This is with pencil, so don't fuss about it yet. We, we can tweak it after. Now, the next part we're gonna do is we're gonna get the tulip in here. Now, this is a rough tulip. This isn't like some of the, the uh, Isnik tulips that have a lot of geometry behind them. This one is a little bit more sketchy. So I'm gonna show you how to do that shape. Um, and then you can kind of make it work within the space that you have here. First of all, in this empty space, kind of choose where you would like that to go. And you're gonna draw a circle like so. It does not need to be a perfect circle. It is just giving you a general shape. Now, I know I have this kind of space in here, so I know where I can extend it. Do I want it to be really long? No, I want it to be kind of a medium size, you know, medium proportioned um, to that. So I'm just gonna sketch this out and probably be about the same amount of the length of the circle is gonna be here. So what I wanna say here is um, use your eyes. Uh, you know, your, your eyes measure incredibly well, just as good as a ruler, trust them. So by looking at this, just make a comparison and it's about there. To add a glossary. Um, I can work on that. Uh, I haven't even done that for my other classes. So that might not happen immediately because there's a lot of different terms. Um, but I'll try my best to include the ones that um, that we covered in. The I've been making some notes class. for you. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thanks so much, Sarah. Okay, so now I am going to bring that in, follow it around like that. Just follow it around and it comes out a little bit. I'm sure most people know the tulip shape, so. Yeah, Could you I move can... the page up just yeah. a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Thanks. Is that is that good enough? Yes, that's great. Okay. So I'm gonna draw in three little bumps like so, and then one in the bottom, and then from there I just connect it into the pot like so. Now usually tulips have three petals that we see in the Isnik design. So that's why I put the three kind of bumps. So we draw that outer petal from that inside bump there and the same with the adjacent one, like so. And then we draw the third visible one here. And that's your tulip. And tulip leaves are usually like this. All right, so now we are going to get going on our, um, our cypress tree. Your carnations, they're all going to be the same. So that's going to be the last one we do because, you know, it's going to fill most of the page. So don't worry, we're getting to it. This one here. So when you tessellate your tile, this direction or this direction or above, they all kind of sit on top of each other. But these motifs on the side, so you'll have a cypress here and a cypress here. These patterns connect to each other. So for the purpose, of this, I'm gonna draw in the kind of leaf motif, 
but normally I would wait until I have tessellated it and then I draw those leaf motifs in so it doesn't look um, like collaged or cut and pasted. So how I draw my leaves is I go up, a very, very elongated S, and I kind of stack the leaves on top of each other. And I follow that line. And then I just stagger them so that they're not kind of all uniform. It's okay if they go outside a little bit, no issue. They can go even in different directions too a little bit. So I'm switching this one up. And if you've ever seen a cypress tree in real life, they, from far away, they will look quite manicured sometimes. And then you get close and you see they're kind of, you know, a little wonky going in different kind of directions, the, uh, at least for the, for the leaves or the needles, so to speak. And so we just keep doing that all the way up the tree. And we just kind of taper it in a little bit. I'm actually gonna bring that out a little bit more there. And then when we get to the top here, yeah, the leaves can be any length. They're about like, you know, a centimeter and a half ish, um, but they should kind of be uniform. They should all be this, you know, rel relatively the same length. And then at the top here, we have it curve out like so. Like that. And then also from the tree along this line here, this kind of circle, um, the first circle we drew, what we have is we have two flowers. So what I do is I kind of put a circle in. These are like the, the easiest flowers to draw out of everything we're gonna do. Like so, we attach the stem to them. Maybe put a little leaf here and then a little leaf on top of that flower. And these are, you know, like the quintessential doodle flower, so to speak, just five, five petals. So I put a circle in the center and then I just do five as equal as you can hand drawn petals, like so. And then this attaches there to the next uh, flower. Now in the original, there are three flowers in this kind of little branch of flowers. Um, but I thought it looked a little crowded when I drew it myself. So I thought two, two is the way to go. Um, can draw another little leaf there like so. All right, so that part is done. Now we are looking at the um, carnations. So there are many different ways to draw carnations within the Google Drive itself. I have included uh, a handout for drawing carnations. Um, that is the ISNIC style, but it will still help you do this one. This one's a little different where there is no separation between the actual petals like you see in the ISNIC one, um, which makes it actually a little simpler. So we have our midpoint here, which is where we put our compass. Um, I'm gonna make kind of a dotted line over here. So you can visualize, you can draw that line with the pencil, no problem. So in the middle here, we're going to draw this kind of motif here, like so. Just three little bumps, one, two, three. And one is higher than the other two. Okay. 
Now in the center here, I'll move my hand in a second. In the center here of that motif, I want you to draw a little leaf. And then it's gonna go out and come down like so. You can even make this a little curvier. I'm showing it curvier on the other side. Yeah, there we go, like so. And then I've just drawn a little kind of circle in the bottom, which is very common for this. Now from this area here, we're gonna measure out. We have a bit of a curve on both sides like that. And then for this one, for the Damascene tile one, it's actually quite simple. And what we do is it's just like a zigzag all the way around this semicircle we've drawn. So you guys are getting off easy for this one. So we have those nice little semicircles all the way around. Now you can tweak those and you know um, play around with them a little bit more. Uh, you can I'm gonna draw one out here as well. Maybe I wanted a little bit more, uh, I don't know, stylized. Maybe we can call it stylized. I'll show you what I mean. So like the bottom pattern or the bottom petals could be, you know, accentuating that kind of curve. You could do that too. The world is definitely your oyster tonight. So then we have this stem here that we're going to connect. We're not going to draw it through the ortaba, through this motif here, um, but we're going to draw it just to the top of it. And we're going to draw some leaves, like so. And these definitely mimic the um, Carnation leaves. If you if you know carnations well, you have the stalk, and then the leaves are kind of integrated into the stalk and grow out. Um, let me see. Do I have anything else? We can add the decoration here. Yeah, we have ten minutes. We can add the decoration here. So this motif here, you're going to transfer it into here. How you can do that is with tracing paper. I'm going to do this first. And I think we'll have enough time for me to show you how to trace if, if you don't know how. So this bottom section here, this is kind of, okay, give me a second. Okay. So this bottom section here, there is going to be a tulip in here and kind of a, a daisy in the bottom. So the daisy is rather quite easy. You draw a semicircle and then three or four petals around it, just like that. And then Just like that. Now the next one, we're gonna put in this little closed form, very similar to this shape we've drawn here. So we have a little bump and then this elongated S line, this curve. And then we have a little circle in there too. Now the next part is um, a simpler tulip. So probably half of this space, I'm gonna put a stem. So it's gonna go from that vertical line into the middle of that space. And by simplified, it's just gonna have kind of two lips, like the name tulip. So I make this kind of squiggle like so, and then I bring those forms into each other. Okay. 
like so. And now that I'm looking at it, I'm seeing my uh, stem. I'm gonna move my stem a tiny bit down and redraw it like that. So it looks a little less kind of forced. And then a little leaf down here. And you can put a little teardrop inside, which is very common in ceramics, in the in the Damascen ceramics. So let's see. We have our leaves. Okay. So um, we have we have the option of putting in one motif in here. In the in the handout, you get you're gonna see um, that there's kind of two sprouting uh, motifs um, for the space that we have here. Because I've extended the tulip a bit, we're gonna have one. So basically, what you're gonna do is you're gonna draw a C shape. Well, a backwards C shape. Like so, right down to the bottom line there, like that. And on the end of that, you're gonna add kind of a teardrop shape. And then I'm not sure if these are supposed to be imitating violets um, or what exactly. I can't remember. I think they are called violets, but heavily stylized, obviously. Like so. And then I'm going to try to put another one on the other side. And what I'm going to do there is I'm just going to move my um, tulip ever so slightly. So make it fit into your shape, unlike what I did tonight. Let's see here. I can bring mine in a little bit. And there we go. Okay, so five minutes left. You can draw these in yourself or you can trace them. For example, if you get a motif you really like and you wanna make sure that it's still gonna look nice and you don't trust yourself to draw it again, I've been there. I, you know, feel that on a, on a regular basis. So you can trace it using uh, tracing paper and then uh, transfer it that way on the other side of your tile. But, you know, basically that is our tile. So that's half of it. So you need to transfer the rest in your spare time. Um, on the handout I've given, I have given some different um, let me screen share. Give me a second. Okay. Okay, so um, here is the handout for this class. Um, this is what we did here on the right hand side. It has the instructions again for you to follow. Um, these are kind of the, the colors that are uh, used in the tile itself. It is turquoise, blue and cobalt. Yeah, turquoise, blue and white. Um, and then also here on the other side, I have shown you some different 
damascene vases. Um, if you are joining into the other classes, we're going to be learning how to draw some different flowers that are going to go inside of these vases. So um, we have, you know, various level of complexity. We have the Rumi motifs on the right hand side, uh, which are definitely not a beginner class. And then on the other side, we have these kind of cloud motifs and flower motifs that are very common. Um, and then we have our little uh, I, um, carnations. And then just barely up at the corner here, we see white and then I did it purple on the other side. Um, those are lilium, uh, lilies. And do I have a picture of that here? Yeah, you see there's some different kind of internal vase patterns that you can, you know, even get creative with. Yeah, I think that's it for those vases. But I'll have more for, for next week. Okay. Um, Lorelai, I've got two questions. One person says, what's the best way to practice drawing the leaves? And the other question is, is there any chance that you could just quickly go through transferring the picture using tracing? Uh, yeah, I can do that. Give me a second to get the tracing paper. Drawing the leaves, <laughs> you've hit on the, you know, number one question students have. <laughs> is it a how long is a piece of string question? <laughs> yeah, so um, you have to practice. Unfortunately, that's the only thing I can, can offer is practice, 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 and then within each flower, they have their own style, just like in nature, right? So we have specific leaves for specific flowers uh, in the Google Drive. Sorry about the sound. Um, in the Google Drive, there are different, uh, there's specifically the carnation. In next week's class, we are doing rose tulip, a more structured tulip rose tulips and hyacinth, which all have their own leaves. Um, sorry about that. And so the, the answer isn't as, you know, as easy um, as giving one solution. It's practicing and then it's also learning the differentiations between the leaves to make them look more realistic. But doodling leaves always helps. Uh, you need to autumn you need to register for the second classes yeah i've sent the link uh, sarah i sent the link already but i'll send it to you uh, personally on the chat okay so quickly um so for those of you who have to leave i totally understand um next week for those who are joining the class please uh i open the class early so try to come on time because that's what takes um a lot of time and we kind of missed about 10 minutes, right? So um, so just do your best. I understand like life is insane right now. I do get that, um, but just do your best. Um, and what was I saying? Um, I'm going to do this. If you have to go, these classes are recorded. Then you can watch it after the last part of the class. OK, so I am tracing my motif. I am using an 8B, that's very soft. You can use a 6B, you can use a 2B, just use something that's not an H. That would be great. So we come over here, we take our motif like so, and we just draw over it. So this is for one motif. What you can do also, you can cover, <coughs> sorry. You can cover the whole half and do it all in one go also. Um, I think it might be some problems with your paper. I suspect that because you, we did the sharing, ah. uh, it's knocked it off the, um, the view. Give me a second. What the heck happened? Did I stop the sharing? No. 
Ah, give me a second. There we go, right? Are we okay now? I think so. Okay. Yes, it's on the view. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so I'm drawing my motif. Here we go. Now there's a couple of ways you can do this. The transfer part, um, you can use a spoon, you can use a window and you just trace over it and let the light shine through. Um, you can use uh, a burnisher, which will, you know, it's made from hematite. So some of you who are, um, you know, in TESIP, you already know what I'm talking about. Um, you can use um, your fingernail um, if you're not precious about them. Um, you can, anything that's hard, I would not, uh, suggest the end of a pencil. Actually, that's that's no good. You can sometimes I will use the end of a marker. That seems to work some reason in comparison. So here we go. Just make sure if you look here, you can see it's kind of it has a glint to it. That means that is the side that has the graphite. We put that down in the correct spot. I'm just guesstimating here. This is just for, for time. And then you're rubbing. And you have to do it quite firmly, not enough to rip the paper. And there you go. It's enough to see. And then you can trace over it like so. There you go. This will be repeated in the other classes too because a lot of the patterns have the symmetry. So don't worry if you didn't catch it this first time um, or you, you also have time to practice. Okay, so thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, these classes are recorded so they're gonna go up onto the uh, Google Drive. Um, and then also, I believe the museum is going to um, try to put those up on YouTube as well. Uh, do we repeat this pattern onto the other circles? Yes, you do. You can do that all the way around and then the same on, on the adjacent side. So you're going to have another one here, like so. And you can play around with that. See, the tree is there. So you could move it in ever so slightly. Yeah, exactly. Charlotte is saying that we're going to put it on YouTube. The I sent the link the for the YouTube earlier, actually. Um, I did send the YouTube link for um, Leighton House. I'll try to, so if you check back through the chat, folks, you should ah, see it I understand. Um, now, uh, the thickness of these, they're actually not thick. They are just a one line stem. They're not like the Isnik ones. So it's just a very simple black stem. That's it. So just like I've drawn here, and then we have this other one that's going to come in like so, and then we draw our other leaves coming out like so. Yeah, so the plan now is, Edwina, you can ink it. So after you finish everything, you can ink it and uh, then you can paint it. Um, and then you can also tessellate the pattern if you, if you want. So you would tessellate over here and you get a full cypress tree and on the other side a full cypress tree. And then these kind of pots stack on top of each other. Okay, let's see anything else. No, I think we're good. Hang on, let me just pop the Leighton House um, YouTube link back in as well. Um, okay, so I'm gonna stop the recording now.